Boa tarde a todos. Estamos, então, agora no ar, com, uh, iniciando né, os, o primeiro, a primeira atividade do Congresso Movências Interdisciplinares da Utopia 2, o Minuto 2, é, que acontece em conjunto também com o Colóquio do Literatura e Utopia, é o sétimo colóquio do Literatura e Utopia, e também teremos o quinto concurso uh, de poesia, uh, Utopia e Poesia, né? é, é, durante esses quatro dias. Então, hoje, então, dia primeiro, uh, nós teremos uh, essa... Uh, né, o primeiro, uh, o primeiro das as, as atividades iniciais, a conferência de abertura, as oficinas eh, que não serão abertas, né, não serão transmitidas no YouTube, e mais tarde nós teremos as atividades artísticas de abertura também do Congresso. A partir de amanhã de manhã, uh, começarão os painéis e as comunicações, enfim, o, o restante das atividades do evento. E a cerimônia de encerramento vai ser no sábado à tarde, né? Então, sábado de manhã e à tarde também teremos atividades. É muito bom uh, é, tê-los por aqui, né? É, ter todo mundo por aqui. E para, então, iniciar, para darmos início, eu gostaria também de agradecer, né? Fazer alguns agradecimentos, primeiramente. Agradecer a, ao Grupo do Literatura e Utopia, a, a, ao, ao, ao PPGL a, da da UFAL, é, que é, ajudou bastante, né, que foi responsável pelo minuto 1, um, foi responsável pelo primeiro minuto e ajudou muito nessa organização, também ao apoio que a gente teve da UFMS, né, então é um, é um, esse é, evento acontece como uma atividade de extensão aqui da UFMS, agradeço a toda a equipe de, é, do comitê científico, que foi muito prestativo né, e deu muitas boas ideias, e também para o comitê organizacional, é, o comitê de organização que, é, sem, sem o qual eu não teria conseguido, né, enfim, esse, esse evento não teria conseguido a, acontecer. Ele acontece de forma remota, pelo contexto em que estamos, mas esperamos, torcemos, né, a nossa grande, a, o nosso grande desejo é que o próximo minuto, o minuto 3, aconteça de forma presencial ou pelo menos híbrida, né, em que a gente possa... É, enfim, ter mais segurança nos deslocamentos. Para não me deter muito mais nisso, né, então, tendo agradecido todos e todas, é, eu vou passar a palavra para a nossa mediadora da, da, da cerimônia de uh, abertura, né, do, da conferência de abertura, que vai apresentar a nossa conferencista. Olá, boa tarde a todas, todos e todes. É uma alegria imensa fazer essa abertura do Minuto 2, não é? é? Por vários motivos e muito especialmente porque, apesar não é, dos tempos difíceis, a gente está conseguindo manter é, as atividades do grupo de pesquisa, está conseguindo manter um ritmo de produção, é, no meio de tudo isso que a gente está vivendo. É, registro os agradecimentos às pessoas que estão nos acompanhando agora, ao querido Elton, não é, que está aqui no backstage e está organizando essa edição do Minuto 2. E queria dizer também da alegria que é realizar o Minuto 2, é, que está sendo sediado na Federal do Mato Grosso do Sul. O evento começou aqui em Maceió em 2018, e já começa a migrar, não é? E para chegar em outras paragens. É, é também uma honra e uma alegria apresentar a nossa conferencista da tarde, que é uma convidada muito especial, a professora, não é? E pesquisadora Rafaela Baculini, que é professora titular no departamento de Interpreting and Translation da Universidade de Bolonha onde ela ensina estudos de gênero e literatura inglesa e norte-americana. As áreas de pesquisa de interesse são as literaturas inglesa e norte-americana no século XX e na contemporaneidade, bem como é, um interesse forte na área de estudos de gênero. Ela integra o METRA e o quadro editorial de vários periódicos e séries acadêmicas, dentre as quais eu menciono Utopian Studies, uh, Mediazione, uh, Spaces of Utopia in Electronic Journal 
e uma série é, de volumes intitulada Rallaheim Book Series, da editora Peter Lyne. Professora Rafaela tem publicado muitos artigos, capítulos e livros sobre literatura de autoria feminina, crítica feminista, utopia, distopia e ficção científica, modernismo, memória e nostalgia, estudos sobre trauma, literatura para jovens adultos e cinema. E entre essas produções todas, não é? eu vou ressaltar aqui nessa tarde um capítulo intitulado At the Root of Totalitarianism, Misogyny and Violence in Women's Dystopias, que está publicado nesse material aqui, nesse livro, não é? Utopias Sonhadas, Distopias Anunciadas, que eu tive a alegria de organizar com a professora Luciana Calado de Plani, que também é do nosso grupo de pesquisa. Esse material está disponível, é, 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 o PDF está disponível no site da editora da UFPB, tá? e é grátis, corram lá. É, um, professora Rafaela gentilmente aceitou o nosso convite para, nesta tarde, noitinha lá na Itália, onde ela está, proferir a conferência intitulada Recuperando a Esperança na Escuridão, o papel de gênero nas narrativas distópicas. Obrigada e bem-vinda, querida Rafaela. Uh, I'm going to do the same presentation in English. Um, it's an honor and, uh, you know, with joy that I introduce to you Professor Rafaela Bacolini, who is full professor in the Department of Interpreting and Translation at Bologna University, where she teaches gender studies and English and North American literature. Her research areas are contemporary and 20th century American and English literature, as well as gender studies. She is a member of METRA and, the, um, and of the editorial board of journals and book series, such as Utopian Studies, Mediazione, uh, Spaces of Utopia, and the Rallaheim book series um, published by Peter Lang. In particular, She has published several articles and chapters on women's literature, feminist criticism, utopia, dystopia, and science fiction, modernism, memory, and nostalgia, trauma studies, young adults literature, and cinema. Among these, I highlight one collaboration with our research group. Uh, she published a chapter uh, entitled um, At the Root of Totalitarianism, Misogyny and Violence in Women's Dystopias. It was published in a collection of essays called uh, Utopias Sonhadas, Dystopias Anunciadas, organized by Luciana Leonora de Plani and myself, which is freely available in the Editora da UFPB site. Uh, Professor Rafael has kindly accepted our invitation to deliver the opening conference of Minuto Dois, entitled Recovering Hope in Darkness, The Role of Gender in Dystopian Narratives, uh, this afternoon, evening in Italy. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, dear Rafaela. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all uh, for being here. And uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Hilni Cavalcanti and Elto Fornaletto uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to take part in this conference. Um, before I start, uh, I would like to talk briefly to say uh, briefly um, what it means to be utopian, a question that Elton asked me and Tom Moylan uh, about a year ago. It was about, you know, exactly a year ago. Um, being a student of utopia and dystopia means for me Uh, to try to become an agent of radical change, to be an activist uh, within and outside the university, to teach and continue to learn and to engage with utopianism as a way of, op of opposing privilege and discrimination and work collectively in intersectional solidarity. Uh, I'm very grateful, uh, therefore, Uh, for the opportunity you are giving me today of being part of your collective, of your group on literature and utopia. Thank you. 
Um, as an Italian woman who did her graduate work in the United States and who specialized um, in American high modernist poetry, um, my approach to utopian studies has been shaped by my cultural and biographical circumstances, as well as by my geography. Um, it is therefore a hybrid approach that combines these geographical and historical circumstances with other issues like desire and of course interest. Um, in particular, my interest in feminist theory and in writing by women has intersected with my belief that good literature <clears throat> is meant to disturb and unsettle readers, a feeling of being out of place not at home in the world is a necessary condition of utopia and of the desire to contribute to the transformation of society. Um, it is an approach that has foregrounded from the very beginning issues of genre writing as they intersect with gender and the deconstruction of high and low culture. Such an approach, however, has and must also come to terms with the political and cultural circumstances that have characterized uh, the recent years. Um, so to begin, um, I'd like to start with a quotation by Virginia Woolf, who could not be farther away from dystopian science fiction. Um, perhaps I could have the uh, PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Okay. The quotation is Wolf's by now famous statement that on or about December 1910, human character changed. All human relations have shifted. Those between masters and servants, husbands and wives, parents and children. And when human relations change, there is at the same time a change in religion, conduct, politics, and literature. I just to start with this quote, because we're witnessing, I think, one of those moments in history, uh, an event that has ruptured the appearance of normality, uh, causing a transformation in relationships, but also in literature and uh, in dystopia in particular. Um, and therefore, such a moment opens a space to rethink our assumptions. Moments of crisis, such as armed conflicts, political transitions, or even watershed events like the 9-11 attacks or the recent pandemic, have always produced significant transformations in gender identities, roles, and relations. While so much has changed regarding the role of women in private and public life, as well as in the social context, notions of masculinity that are a barrier to gender equality have been challenged too, but the struggle often results in an effort to take back control of female roles, bodies, and sexuality. Considering, for example, a watershed event that has shaken the confidence of many, such as September 11th, several studies have investigated the gender nature of the psychological response to the attacks. Uh, one such work is Susan Faludi's The Terror Dream, uh, where she described the post 9-11 age as an era of reconstituted traditional manhood, redomesticated femininity, and nuclear family togetherness. According to Faludi, the American media, entertainment, and advertising reacted to the event by blaming women's liberation and the subsequent feminization of American men that left the nation vulnerable as the real culprit of the attacks. The myth of cowboy arrogance <clears throat> and feminine weakness, revived every time the nation felt vulnerable, was restored once again through fables of female peril and the rescue of just one girl, aiming at displacing Americans' insecurity. While American men were cast back in the role of heroes, the ideal uh, post 9-11 American woman was instead, instead undemanding, uncompetitive, and dependent, recast as a mere victim deprived of agency. This conservative retreat to the mid-1950s culture has affected even the dystopian genre. 
I'm thinking here of films like Steven Spielberg's 2005 adaptation of A.G. Wells' A World of the World, or John Hillcoat's 2009 adaptation of Corbin McCarthy's uh, The Road. Uh, two films where the gender narrative is split along the lines of invincible manhood, and more specifically, manly protectiveness and fatherhood, and jeopardized femininity, a restoring of the traditional nuclear family and a critique of the emasculation brought about by feminism. What follows then is a reflection on the genre of dystopia, how it has changed, its constituent elements and their transformations with a look in particular to its gender dimension. In my work, in fact, I've been studying dystopian literature in its formal and thematic features while trying to look for other modes of articulating horizons of hope. Together with many others, I've come to believe that contemporary dystopian production in its themes and in its formal aspects um, is an example of an oppositional and resisting form of writing, one that maintains hope and utopian horizon within the pages of dystopia in these very dark times. So my first section is on definitions, genres, and boundaries. Before I venture into the matter of definitions, it is necessary to say that they are intellectual constructs. They include and therefore also exclude, but as Utopia's most prominent bibliographer, Lyman Tower Sargent has reminded us, and, I, and there's a quotation here, uh, they are rarely or ever useful at the extremes. Um, and the boundaries established by definitions are both movable and porous or permeable. But for certain purposes, for example, bibliographies, uh, boundaries are necessary, and I would add that so are uh, definitions. The notion of genre carries with it the binary opposition between original and derivative, hence superior and inferior, with an implied validation of the former over the latter. As feminist scholars, we might want to question the very notion of genre, boundaries, and exclusionary politics and to investigate instead the intersection of gender and generic fiction and the ways in which gender enters into and is constructed by the form of the genre and in turn helps to create new texts. Genres have definite rules, conventions and expectations. And until recently, a writer's art was shown through their faithful observation of such norms. According to Frederick Jameson, in the political unconscious, genres are, and here there's another quote, essentially literary institutions or social contracts between a writer and a specific public whose function is to specify the proper use of a particular cultural artifact. Thus the history of literary genres allows us to understand a given literary work, not only as an individual text, subject to imminent analysis, but also as one which can be further understood historically in terms of the evolution of the particular form and of the societal events and contradictions of which it is a part. And this is a quote uh, by Tom Moylan in The Bend Impossible. But genres are also clearly implicated in the literary history and form of production that were traditionally supposed to classify and neutrally describe. Since Aristotle's po poetics, in fact, genre theory has been concerned with the delimitation of boundaries as well as the hierarchizing of genres. But as Celeste Schenk points out in her essay on women's poetry and autobiography, what seems to be just a literary theory is actually drenched in ideologies. For Schenk, and rightly so, the ordering of genres has rested upon much more than aesthetic. Traditionally viewed as purely aesthetic markers, genres have been highly politicized, not only gendered, but also class biased and racially biased in the long history of Western literary criticism, a phenomenon that has had enormous implications 
for the banishment of women writers and other marginalized groups from the canon. Genres, like definitions, are cultural construction then. Implied in the notion of genre and boundaries lies a binary opposition between what is normal and what is deviant, a notion that feminist criticism has attempted to deconstruct since the difference consigns feminine practice to inferiority. Moreover, Western genre theory remains for the most part prescriptive and legislative, as its main preoccupation continues to be the establishment of limits, boundaries, and exclusions. Women writers, therefore, have necessarily had to resist and possibly revise the essentially masculine literary heritage with its notions of well-defined genres, while feminist critics have exposed different issues regarding women's writing, canon formation, and genre theory. In particular, feminist criticism has focused on the way in which women were marginalized into non-canonical genres, on women's use of generic forms traditionally dominated by men, and women's use of genres of their own although feminist theory has also questioned the very establishment of genre and its consequences. Feminist appropriations of generic texts, on the other hand, have become radical revision of conservative genres. While some contemporary women writers carry out a conscious revision and reappropriation of generic texts from a feminist perspective, some others employed similar strategies well before Adrian Rich's notion of revision became a conscious methodological approach of gender studies. Anne Cranick Francis, in fact, points out that the use of generic fiction as a form of political resistance has a long history. What these women share, whether consciously or not, is the manipulation of genre conventions and the rejection of the um, high-low culture classification or dichotomy. Such an undertaking becomes an oppositional strategy, a site of resistance against the hegemonic ideology that, among other things, sees women and other marginalized groups linked with the notion of deviance and inferiority. My second section is on dystopia, its conventions and developments. As far as dystopia is concerned, the intersection of gender and genre has been of paramount importance for the development of the genre. Themes such as the representation of women and their bodies, reproduction and sexuality, and language and its relation to identity have helped to challenge and denounce stereotypes and damaging notions about women and gendered identities. Interventions on the convention of dystopia have also contributed to the transformation of the genre, what I, what I initially called open-ended or critical dystopias, which has become a flourishing genre since the 1980s, and in particular in recent years. In the three phases of Utopia Revisited, Sargent defines dystopia, and I quote, as a non-existent society described in considerable detail and normally located in time and space that the author intended a contemporaneous reader to view as considerably worse than the society in which the reader lived. In Sargent's definition, dystopia is then a textual form, uh, which by the middle of the 20th century has become the dominant form of utopian literature. In my own work, and together with Tom Moylan, Ilnica Valcanti, <clears throat> Ruth Levitas, Lucy Sargison, and all the contributors to Dark Horizons, we have examined the emergence, particularly in the late 80s, though we found examples before and certainly after the 1980s, of what we have termed together the critical dystopia. We trace the origin of this formal development of the literary dystopia to the neoliberal principles of the 1980s as a reaction to the times and their values. While maintaining the familiar narrative structure of the dystopia, these resignified novels offer a capacity for narrative that creates the possibility for social critique 
and utopian anticipation in the dystopian text. The new critical dystopias describe a mostly dystopian future society, but they also portray surviving and imperfect utopian enclaves within the larger dystopian world. By changing the traditional tragic ending of classical dystopias, the critical dystopias maintain the utopian impulse at the level of four. And I think there's another quote here that comes from uh, an early article <laughs> that I wrote. Uh, Traditionally, a bleak, depressing genre with no space for hope within the story, utopian hope is maintained in dystopia only outside the story. It is only if we consider dystopia as a warning that we as readers can hope to escape such a pessimistic future. This option is not granted to the protagonists of George Orwell's 1984 or Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Winston Smith, Julia, John the Savage, and Lenina are all crushed by the totalitarian society. There is no learning, no escape for them. Conversely, the new critical dystopias allow readers and protagonists to hope by resisting closure. The ambiguous, open, and today I would add precarious endings of these novels maintain the utopian impulse within the work. In fact, by rejecting the traditional subjugation of the individual at the end of the novel, the critical dystopia opens a space of contestation and opposition for those collective eccentric subjects whose class, gender, race, sexuality, and other positions are not empowered by hegemonic rule. Therefore, we argued that the critical dystopia, dystopian form, both in its 1980s transformation and as a generic category that can still be applied today, offers an exploration of agency that is based in difference and multiplicity, yet cannily reunited in an alliance politics that speaks back in a larger, though diverse, collective voice, yet with the consequence that the new dystopias not only critique the present system, but also explore ways to transform it. Thus, these texts resignify the, link, the links between imagination and utopia, and utopian awareness and decidedly pessimistic times. They allow us to continue to recover hope in darkness. Dystopia remains for me fundamentally a term for a distinct literary genre with its particular history, its formal characteristics, but also its evolving form. In fact, if my understanding of dystopia has changed over the years, since the historical and material conditions and the use of dystopia have also changed. The fact that dystopia is a narrative textual practice, where by textual, I mean both uh, a literary or a filmic text, for example, has remained the same. The ambiguous open ending is perhaps the most characteristic feature of the new critical dystopias. By challenging the traditional expectations that dystopias must end tragically, these texts also open spaces of resistance and maintain the utopian impulse within the story. I will return to this, but I want to continue first uh, with some other formal features and strategies of the genre. If it is commonly accepted that traveling is an essential element of the utopian experience, it is equally shared that it is absent in the dystopian genre. Classical dystopian novels open directly on the nightmarish society with no need for time and or space dislocation for the dystopian citizen. The typical utopian narrative is composed in fact by a description of the good place and a reflection on the problems of the author's own society by means of a comparison between the original and the visited place. The dystopian text, on the other hand, usually begins directly in the terrible new world. And yet the element of textual estrangement and the critique of society soon become clear since on the one hand, the narrative often revolves around the protagonist who questions the dystopian society. 
and on the other, because uh, of dystopian narrative structure, that is a narrative of the hegemonic order in a counter narrative of resistance, a master narrative in a counter narrative. Thus, this reflection is consistent with Frederick Jameson's recognition of dystopia's narrative concern for what happens to a specific subject or character. But we identify these two elements as those which contribute to making the new dystopian form a solid instrument of resistance and critique. As we have observed in Dark Horizons, since the text opens in media, in media rests, with the nightmarish society, within the nightmarish society, cognitive and political estrangement are at first reduced by the immediacy and normality of the location. No dream or trip is taken to get to this place of everyday life. The protagonist and the reader are always already in the world in question, uh, immersed in the society. However, a counter narrative develops as the dystopian citizen moves from apparent contentment into an experience of alienation and resistance. Or in what Tom Moylan has called in, become, in becoming utopian, a break or gestalt shift from their closed subjectivity that opens out into the possibilities of radical utopian agency. This structural strategy of narrative and counter narrative most often plays out by way of the social and antisocial use of language. Throughout the history of dystopian fiction, the conflict of the text turns out, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, the conflict of the text turns on the control of language. To be sure, the official hegemonic order of most dystopias rests, as Antonio Gramsci put it, on both coercion and consent. The dystopian protagonist's resistance often begins with a verbal confrontation and the reappropriation of language, since he or she is generally prohibited from using language. And when he or she does, it means nothing but empty propaganda. Taking control over the means of language, representation, and memory is a crucial weapon and strategy in moving dystopian resistance from an initial consciousness to an action which leads to a climactic event that attempts to change the society. <clears throat> <clears throat> As opposed to the utopian plot of dislocation, education, and return of an informed visitor, Dystopia, therefore, generates its own account in the critical encounter that occurs when the protagonist confronts or is confronted by the contradictions of the society that is present from the very first pages. There are three other constituents of the dystopian genre that um, I think need to be uh, addressed or mentioned. Uh, genre blurring, the link between hope and precariousness, and the feeling of discomfort. While genre blurring is part of my early work on the critical dystopia, uh, the last two are uh, somewhat more recent and are linked to my work on the commodification of dystopia, my more recent work. Genre blurring is another strategy that makes these novels sites of resistance in oppositional texts. By borrowing specific conventions from other genres, critical dystopias more often blur the established boundaries of the dystopian form and thereby expand its creative potential for critical expression. Drawing on the feminist criticism of universalist assumption, fixity, singularity, neutral and objective um, knowledge, and recognizing instead the importance of differences multiplicity, complexity, partial and situated knowledges, as well as hybridity and fluidity, the critical dystopias resist genre purity in favor of an impure or hybrid text, which renovates dystopia by making it formally and politically oppositional. For example, Octavia Butler's Kindred revises the convention of the time travel story and creates a novel <clears throat> that is both science fiction and slave narrative. 
uh, while a parable of the sower combines survivalist science fiction with the diary and the slave narrative. Um, similarly, Margaret Atwood employs the convention of the diary <clears throat> and the epistolary novel to narrate the life of her protagonist. Furthermore, her Handmaid's Tale and her sequel, The Testaments, become also literature of witness. Uh, or, or again, uh, by fragmenting the narrative of the future society with the narrative of 16th century Prague, uh, Pierce's He, She, and It creates a historical science fiction novel. So it is the very notion of an impure genre with permeable borders which allow contamination from other genres that represents resistance to hegemonic ideology and renovates the resisting nature of dystopia and makes it also multi-oppositional. The last aspects that I want to draw your attention to uh, are those of precarious hope and discomfort are linked together and I've always considered them necessary fundamental ingredients of dystopia. Darren Webb, among others, has noted the depoliticization and domestication of Bloch and his concept of hope. And I quote, Bloch is the touchstone for countless studies which point to and celebrate <clears throat> traces of utopian hope to be found in the fabric of everyday life. An ever-growing number of conference papers take as their focus a television program, a pulp novel, a playground, a piece of music, fashion design, gaming, the performativity of a play, and use block as a means of uncovering the traces of hope to be found there. But no project is suggested, no politics stems from these studies, no course of action is developed. Traces of hope are simply pointed to or pointed at. The realization that utopia had been com commodified and domesticated is certainly not new. As others have already noted, among whom Ruth Levitas, the concept of utopia has been applied too generously even within the field of utopian studies, where, for example, cruises have come to represent instances of utopian desire. What we are witnessing today is the appropriation and commodification of dystopia as well. Dystopian fiction has become trendy and mainstream, especially after the success of Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games trilogy in the year 2008-2010 uh, and the rediscovery of Margaret Atwood's uh, Handmaid's Tale uh, in 2016 uh, also thanks to the huge success of its TV adaptation. Another example of this co-optation is the proliferation of dystopian and post-apocalyptic TV series. Even more problematic appropriations of dystopia are represented by the now withdrawn Halloween sexy handmade costume or the various Handmaid's Tale theme party and fashion. These examples represent a form of appropriation where something transgressive and radical is taken, tamed, co-opted, neutralized, and commodified. Repressing women's reproductive rights becomes a game, and dystopia becomes a place that readers can casually visit, party in, and then emerge from as untouched. The taming of dystopia destroys the recognition of precariousness and vulnerability, which are constituents of the genre, by reassuring its audience and by moving these features into security zones of middle and high class conformism and consumerism. Against the depolitization of dystopia, of block, <coughs> excuse me, and of his notion of hope, I think it is necessary to remember that hope is, for Bloch, the opposite of security. <clears throat> One thing that I've always found problematic in the commodification of utopia 
is the idea that the mere pursuit of happiness is necessary to reach utopia. I do believe instead that a feeling of being out of place, not at home in the world, is a necessary condition of utopia. In my work on critical nostalgia, I spoke of a slight suffering as necessary. <coughs> Excuse me again. Today, I would revise my notion as one of discomfort. The presence of utopian hope, as we have said, doesn't need a consoling and comforting happy ending. Rather, discomfort seems to be the precondition of hope. Discomfort and the precarity of hope are the conditions of the citizens and the readers of dystopia, as good literature must disturb and unsettle. And here, I would agree with Sarah Hamed, who in Living a Feminist Life invites us to stay unhappy in this world because happiness is used to justify social norms as social goods. The power to unsettle the readers and not to, re to reassure them remains one of the key critical elements of dystopia and of critical dystopias in particular. It is what allows protagonists and hopefully readers alike to become utopian, to hark back to Tom Moylan's title. <clears throat> the third section is about critical dystopias today uh, with an example from uh, a novel uh, by Lenny Zumas called Red Clocks. In the last part of my talk, I want to show that there is still a strong critical utopian output through critical dystopia. Despite the emptiness of complicit commodification, there are still critical dystopias that continue the work of critique and transformation. But how have they changed? Because utopian literature is always a product of the historical and material conditions in which writers live, there have been changes both at the level of form and themes. As far as themes are concerned, some, some stand out and have to do with the crisis of our times, sometimes set in an alternative world almost co-equal with the authors present. The climate emergency, including the spread of viruses, make up a consistent number of dystopian texts nowadays. And here I'm just name dropping, basically. I'm just naming uh, some authors, okay? Uh, for example, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, Larissa Lai, uh, N.K. Jemisin, Emily St. John Mandel, Emmy Taranta, Nicola Maniti. Another theme that has seen a flourishing of dystopian texts, thanks to the backlash on women's rights in many parts of the world, is the status and experience of women with themes like the ban on abortion, reproduction, infertility, rape. And here um, I would you know, name uh, once again Atwood, uh, Zumas, uh, Alderman, or Dalker, okay? Um, and, and let me say that I'm naming also dystopias or critical dystopias that are not necessarily masterpieces, like for example, Vox by Dalker, I think that it's, a very problematic uh, text uh, that starts, you know, with a, with an interesting premise, but then, um, you know, it, it's really doesn't end well. <laughs> uh, likewise, the experience of immigration and immigration finds space in contemporary dystopias, in books by Mohsin Ahmed, uh, Gillian Cross, John Lanchester, as well as the contested nature of global electronic technology and culture with books by Cory Doctorow or Dave Eggers. In these texts, the narratives develop in a critical dystopian mode, focusing on individuals that are at odds with the dystopian society. If hopeful, yet precarious and uncertain alternatives are still developed within the pages of the text, uh, rather than lingering in some extra textual outside. The narrative moves are, however, often those of small interventions and, <clears throat> and changes, small steps, sometimes highly personal. Such narratives are therefore fragmented 
an individual. And yet, by being developed through multiple points of view in novels like, you know, uh, The Testament by Atwood, uh, Red Clocks by Zumas, or New York 2140 by Robinson, uh, Exit West uh, by Amid, uh, or um, uh, The Power by Alderman, um, they also generate a collective rather than an individual agency. Finally, the presence of genre blurring is also maintained in some of these texts, as the dystopian narrative blurs element with fantasy, magic realism, historical and realistic fiction, the diary, and the biographical genre. In the tremendous output of dystopia of our times, one of the most interesting examples of how dystopia can recover hope in darkness out of precariousness, discomfort, unsettling endings, awareness, and responsibility is Lenny Zuma's Red Clocks, which came out in 2018. The future imagined by Lenny Zuma's in this novel is not as extreme as other feminist dystopias, thinking again at Atwood, for example. Nevertheless, it shares with them the violation of reproductive rights. At the heart of the novel are the stories of four women whose lives intertwine and they come to terms with an imagined America that is not so distant from today's situation. Abortion is illegal, in vitro fertilization is banned, embryos have full rights, and a law prohibiting <clears throat> adoption for, un uh, for unmarried individuals is about to be passed. It is the voice of Raw, one of the four women, who explains the situation. And I quote, Two years ago, the United States Congress ratified the Personhood Amendment, which gives the constitutional right to, liber to life, liberty, and property to fertilize the egg at the moment of conception. Abortion is now illegal in all 50 states. Abortion providers can be charged with second degree murder, abortion seekers with conspiracy to commit murder. In vitro fertilization too is federally banned because the amendment outlaws the transfer of embryos from laboratory to uterus. The embryos can give the consent to be moved. As if this were not enough, a pink wall divides the US border from Canada to prevent women to get an abortion there, where Canadian women's rights are still guaranteed. As Zuma herself revealed in an interview, all the restrictions she imagined are based on real proposals by American politicians, such as Republicans Mike Pence and Paul Ryan, proposals that under the Trump-Pence administration no longer seem to be extreme, but were actual, actually real threats. As Zuma stated, and I quote, Pence is one of the politicians who helped me imagine our, our current hell. As governor of Indiana, he sought to discipline and punish the bodies of women and LGBTQ people. In 2005 and 2007, he co-sponsored federal legislation that would recognize human zygotes as legal persons, thereby outlawing not only abortion, but certain fertility treatments and all non-barrier forms of contraception. In 2016, Pence signed a bill later blocked by a federal judge that would require women who have miscarriages or abortions to pay for the fetus's funeral. Another radical conservative who gave me ideas for red clocks is Paul Ryan, a longtime proponent of so-called personhood amendments. He co-sponsored the 2013 Sanctity of Human Life Act, which would grant full legal rights to a fertilized human egg. <clears throat> the effects of these situations on the lives of the individual characters, uh, Ro in particular, a single woman who's trying to have a baby, and Matty, a 16-year-old dealing with an unwanted pregnancy, raise their awareness of the oppressive society and initiate a narrative trajectory that moves from apparent containment into an experience of alienation and resistance into the possibilities of radical utopian agency. Awareness is the first step. 
Zumas's characters regret not, act not acting in time and being simple bystanders, those who know but do not lift a finger. In addition to Rose, a high school teacher desperately trying to have a child on her own while writing the biography of Eivor Miner Vudotir, a fictitious 19th century polar explorer. The other narrative voices belong to Susan, a wife mother trapped in an unhappy marriage, Mattie, one of Rose's best students who find herself pregnant and seeks an abortion, and Jin, a healer whose arrest and trial for her, for her activities contribute to bringing all the women together. The voices and lives of the four women intertwine and create the story of a community where women who rebel against the imposition dictated by society are strengthened through alliances and solidarity, in a word, through interdependence. Through the story of the bonds between women who can be as supportive as they are competitive, the novel shows the conflicting but valid feelings that every woman who desires or experiences pregnancy and motherhood may have. In particular, every woman is faced with difficult and complicated choices, intrinsically linked to a self-determination that in the novel is threatened not only by laws, but also by personal dilemmas and biases that the women have about themselves and that they imagine the community also has about them. In short, by expectations about what a woman should be or should want. Thus the novel manages to maintain the complexity of the different positions of the four female characters without judging the choice of carrying a pregnancy to term, ending it or adopting a child. Zumas does not choose with what would be the possibility of adoption, the easier and more comforting and, com and compensatory way of a private accommodation between Rose's yearning for motherhood and Mattie's desire not to become a mother. Instead, the novel's open ending allows each of the character to face their choices and responsibilities, and in so doing, to embrace their contradictions and to desire more than one thing, so that in Rose's voice, she will be able to see what it is and to see what is possible, thus opening up the space of a precarious, fragile hope. My conclusion, a critique of and desire to transform our present, using challenging themes, complex visions, and unsettling endings, Writers can motivate readers. As Jack Zipes also reminds us, without discontent, there is no utopia. We must feel out of place, not at home, in the world, and we need dystopias to mobilize us, to own the discomfort that will educate us into a displacement from and critique of the societies we live in. Reading dystopias can promote critical thinking and foster hope for change. Thus, the precariousness of open endings serves to disturb, challenge, and motivate readers. By resisting the conventions of reassuring readers, the futures foreshadowed in dystopian novels do not foreclose hope. They actually mobilize readers to intervene critically in the imagination and construction of a future they desire, and to possibly do something in their present that can begin to build that future. The critical dystopia then stresses the connection between imagination and critique. Discomfort, awareness, resistance, solidarity, and interdependence are necessary to activate precarious hope. When combined, they are the tools of the critical dystopia with which we can crack the darkness, let the light in, and begin to dismantle the master's house, to use an expression from Audrey Lord. Critical dystopias then provide a means to analyze and critique the present and provoke a militant awakening with the potential for radical utopian agency. I want to end with two quotations that for me 
uh, sum up the extremely important work of dystopia and literature in recovering hope today. The first is from a speech by Neil Gaiman called Why Our Future Depends on Libraries, Reading and Daydreaming, where he discusses the importance of reading books fostering literacy and imagination, especially for children. Although it doesn't quite talk about dystopia, it nonetheless addresses the importance of discomfort and of a literature that unsettles. Fiction can show you a different world. It can take you somewhere you've never been. Once you've visited other worlds, you can never be entirely content with the world you grew up in. And discontent is a good thing. People can modify and improve their worlds, live them better, live them different if they're discontented. The second and last one is from Marge Piercy and comes from an essay called Active in Time and History, a reflection about her own writing of political novels. Again, imagination is linked with understanding and acting and literature becomes the place where readers are shaped and mobilized. Imagination is powerful, whether it's working to make us envision our inner strengths and the vast energy and resources locked into ordinary people and capable of shining out in crisis, capable of breaking out into great good or great evil, or whether imagination is showing us utopias, dystopias, or merely societies in which some variable has changed. When such societies are imagined, we can better understand ourselves by seeing that what we are not to better grasp what we are. We can also then understand what we want to move toward and what we want to prevent in the worlds our children must inhabit. So, um, I want to end though with a final positive example of the power of dystopia today. I've spoken earlier of the appropriation of Atwood's symbol, the handmaid's costume, but that symbol has also served to support political struggles around the world. The handmaid's costume continues in fact to be used in a number of protest demonstration. In Poland, for example, last July, women took to the streets in protest against the government's decision to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention, the one against violence against women and for the protection of victims of gender violence. In Italy, and you have a picture here, for instance, in June of this year, women dressed as handmaids protested against the local government's decision to obstruct women's request for pharmacological, pharmacological abortion. Handmaids continue to regularly welcome, uh, continued um, to regularly welcome former US President Donald Trump in the various destinations of his official visits and spurred the protests of transversal feminist groups such as Niuna Menos. Offred and the Handmaids have inspired a resilient and fighting community that spans generation and national borders. In this case, identification has been able to sustain political movements and struggles in support of the common vulnerabilities caused by oppression and reactionary forces, including those of totalitarian regime or those disguised as false democracies. There should be uh, a picture about one of these uh, uh, rallies, okay? Um, I have insisted that literature must unsettle Literary and visual narratives can be seen as forms of transmissible viruses. Like viruses with effects that spread globally, language and storytelling can have the extraordinary power of stimulating the antibodies that are necessary to understand and critically reassess the intrinsic connections among past, present, and future. In dark times, critical dystopias with their permeable borders, their invocation of precariousness and discomfort, their resistance to closure can thus be seen as a vaccine where the virus is inoculated in order to activate a cognitive resistant 
response. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Rafaela, for this beautiful talk, very panoramic view on the interfaces between dystopias and the gender and genre. Um, I really appreciate it and I'm sure the audience uh, did so too. I can read some of the comments here uh, just now saying it was a great conference, a fantastic uh, conference. Um, and uh, many people thanking for your thanking you for your words. And um, I was very much moved by your talk uh, in a very personal way because this has also been a uh, um, part of my interest. I mean, uh, feminism and dystopia and the role of narrative in terms of uh, trying to map evils and trying to envision hopeful possibilities. So you, you made this uh, a very uh, long and panoramic view of uh, the feminist dystopias that you have been reading over uh, so many years of study. So thank you very much. I wonder if we have any questions for Rafaela. I myself am very curious about, um, you mentioned many texts. Uh, you made a, a short list of some <laughs> of the contemporary uh, dystopias you have been reading, you know, the, the fresher work that has been produced in this uh, um, century. And uh, I was wondering, uh, you said something that made me think about Vox. Uh, <laughs> you criticized Vox. Uh, I was curious to hear more, uh, if you could say more about Vox. It's very clearly influenced by The Handmaid's Tale mm -hmm. in terms of um, um, speech and the uh, prohibition of speech. So if you could, you know, give us some more ideas about your critique on that novel, that would be nice. And uh, another issue that is, you know, very uh, interesting for us here at the moment is, uh, uh, you mentioned some of the ways critical dystopias have evolved from the 80s onwards. And uh, you, you even mentioned some of the ways in which they have um, they have changed in terms of themes, in terms of forms. And then you gave us this very nice reading of uh, Red Clocks. Uh, I, was, I haven't read Red Clocks yet, uh, and I was wondering about uh, the ending. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious about, you know, those dystopias uh, that have been produced now that tend to forge some way of... Um, um, political coalitions at the end that appear, at least to me, to be a very important uh, move in terms of dystopian writings, because uh, if on the one hand hope appears to be precarious, on the other hand it is still there. As I would said in the Matt Adam uh, trilogy, one of the characters, I don't remember which one now, mm -hmm. that said hope is a risky business, hope is a risk. Yes, mm -hmm. but that's all there is. I mean, what are we supposed to do if there is no hope? And I see in those coalitions by the end of some, you know, very recent dystopias, uh, some horizon of hope. Would you agree with this? Um, let me see if I have any, any more questions here. And if you could please just say something about those uh, comments as I check the chat. <laughs> To sure. see if there are more questions. So uh, to start with uh, with Vox, um, uh, when I when I started the, the the book, I was really actually I thought it was a great you know premise. Uh, this idea uh, you know of uh, of language continuing a tradition really, um, as we as we said, um, and. Um, 
and uh, what what I think uh, is missing from from the book is um, well, um, I I think it, it well I think it's partly it has to do with with uh, stereotypes and cliches, right? Uh, um, and uh, and I and I also think that um, it's a little too easy. It's a little too comforting uh, as a um, as a book. You know, I, I think that the uh, the problem of these um, of these novels that end uh, that end well, right? That that have an happy ending. Uh, she goes to Italy, if I if I remember correctly, with her with this beautiful, <laughs> handsome uh, man, and her husband dies. I, I'm I'm trying to re to recollect it. You know, um, I think it, I think it. You know, it tends to reassure us. You know, and it's like, uh, um, and it failed in a way uh, because. Uh, because you know you close the book it's like that what i was saying you know dystopia becomes a place that you can visit and then you can come out and continue your life continue to to, to live your life uh as if nothing happened okay so um that is you know a little bit what worries me about these more commercial uh kinds of uh, of dystopias and especially uh, I think uh, the problem is especially for young adults because they, you know, of course, there's been uh, tons of uh, of um, uh, young adult novels, dystopian young adult novels, um, that you know, uh, unless you unsettle them, as I said, you know, the risk is that uh, once again, you know, the reader closes the book and uh, and continues his or her life. Uh, untouched, and uh, and so um, that would be a uh, you know that would be what I have you know against uh, uh, Vox <laughs> to some extent. Okay. Uh, Actually, there is a question about young adults uh, uh, mm -hmm. dystopias here, and uh, because you mentioned them, maybe I should ask the question so that you could sure. try and uh, connect the ideas. The question is. Um, the person, Brisa Palma, asks you um, what you think about the growth of uh, young adults' uh, dystopian sagas by women with uh, female protagonists, uh, such as, you know, Hunger Games and Divergent and The Selection. What do you think of those uh, uh, sagas? Um, well, uh, again, I have mixed feelings. Uh, I think I, when Hunger Games came out, uh, you know, I think I stayed up all night and finished the the first book. You know, I was really, uh, I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. Um, again, um, and I think Hunger Games is special. You know, um, then I think it has become like a a trend, and so um, there are so many um, other novels that have come out, and uh, it's just become, you know, uh, maybe a computer could write them, you know, with the with the same ingredients, uh, more or less. And um, what again, what worries me, I, you know. Uh, I may sound rep repetitive, but I think the ending is really what what <laughs> what changes uh, the importance of uh, of these books. And because they are young adults uh, novels, uh, they tend to be a little too much reassuring. Although Divergent is not, um, but you know, um, Katniss, the, the 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 ending of uh, Hunger Games is uh, um, a conventional marriage, you know, it's like so it, 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 it's reduced to some extent, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that uh, a little bit problematic, a little bit 
uh, you know, once again, reassuring. Um, okay. Uh, and the other thing, of course, the other problem with young adults uh, is that it, it's such a, um, you know, uh, they're so successful that then you have, you know, the, the, the market, the commercialization of the young adults, and then you have the t-shirts, you have the film, you have the action figures, you have, you know, so really it's one way of commodifying um, dystopia. I, w I was thinking about Divergent in particular. Um, one thing that really struck me uh, was a, at the end of the first volume, I think, there's a, some 50 or 60 pages um, um, that are there to, to create a hype. You know, there's the track list, uh, the Divergent track list, so the music that you can listen with, with Divergent. There's a, um, a, a quiz so that you know if you are, you know, one, one uh, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the, the, uh, the district, the, yeah, district. whatever, yes, yeah. the, the, um, or, you know, and then, and then also fans were, were created, fan, uh, fandoms, uh, mm -hmm. so that, you know, the, 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 the author, uh, in the, in the following books, thanked uh, the different factions, you know? And it was like, this is a book against factions. Why do you have, fa you know, why are you thanking yeah. people that identify in factions? What, what didn't you get, <laughs> you know? So uh, what's the point? Exactly. Yes, so, so that's also, you know, uh, another trend that is problematic with young adults, this commodification, this okay. marketing. Uh, thank you very much. There is something that I forgot to mention as you finished your talk is that, you know, the political use of the handmaid's costumes uh, mm -hmm. also happened in Brazil, in Brasilia, mm -hmm. during the um, pro-abortion manifestations about two years ago. Uh, I'll send you some news about it. I think there's something in English. But uh, yes, the handmaids are everywhere and they are protesting. And this is, you know, good news. It's not only in, you know, sex shops and stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, it, it's an, at least, uh, again, another glimpse of hope, you know, where, where you see uh, the dystopia has, has made an impact, has had, you know, um, and it, it's really transgenerational. transgenerational. And um, and so that I think it's a, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, I'm hearing an echo. It's funny on my side. <laughs> Something. Let me speak again. Yes, now it's it's back to normal. <laughs> um, loads of thank yous here to you. Um, but uh, no, no more questions, I think. Yes, this is it. Uh, so maybe um, uh, I could ask you another question if you don't mind. Um, you were mentioning precarious hope and um, um, this is something new for me. I had not you know, heard about precarious hope before. So could you say more about this? I mean, is this a diminished sort of hope? Is this a kind of uh, fragile hope? Uh, how, how would you describe this type of hope that you are calling precarious? And uh, would you think this is a mark of uh, you know, more contemporary texts uh, in uh, as different from you know what came before from what came last century what are your thoughts about this mm -hmm. um, no I don't think it's diminished I think it's fragile yes uh, but I wouldn't 
um, identify it as uh, uh, as in, as an inferior kind of uh, kind of hope. I just think that um, the times are probably more precarious, and 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 in a way, it's a um, an adjustment to, mm -hmm. to the times. Uh, so yes, I would I would say that um, it, it's more specific to the more contemporary uh, kind of uh, dystopias. Um, it would seem to me, um, and um, it, it's um, I I I really I really think of Octavia Butler. When I, when I think of precariousness, when I think of hope, um, uh, because I think it, she she really taught us a great lesson uh, of you know how to resist in uh, in conditions that are not at all you know <laughs> that are dystopian, right? And yeah. uh, and I think that um, I really appreciate. Um, her, her short stories, her novels in particular, um, because she shows us characters that need to negotiate. And, and this negotiation, this mediation, this uh, coming to terms with, uh, with the conditions in which you live and the fact that, you know, you have to uh, adjust your hope also in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. that you cannot always get <laughs> what you want. And uh, uh, I think it's a very uh, useful lesson that, uh, so um, I think that I've started, uh, even if Octavio Butler, you know, was writing in the 80s and 90s, uh, but, I, but I think that, that um, it's out of Butler that this idea of precariousness uh, and um, and the idea that that resistance can also uh, be achieved through negotiation, uh, through mediation, okay, not only uh, by you know uh, a violent fight or um, which is something that um, you know it's in it's in a lot of. Uh, uh, science fiction by women. I'm thinking even of uh, Joanna Ross when it changed, you know, um, the ending uh, once again. I think endings are. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they, they are key. <laughs> and um, I must confess in public that, you know, the, the ending of uh, the Testaments made a huge difference for me <laughs> because you know, I needed something like that. <laughs> um, oh, well, I think that's all for today, Rafaela. Um, well, there is another question that has just appeared here for us. Um, Felipe Benicio is asking you, uh, due to all the transformations dystopia has undergone, in recent years, do you think that we should use a different term to describe it? Or oh, this is a biased question. <laughs> He's very much interested in this. <laughs> yeah. Um. No, I guess I'm. I'm. I'm uh, I still like. I'm. I'm still uh, attached to the idea of the critical dystopia I still I still like what it represents um, in a way I still think um, that you know I mean I don't want to sound prescriptive but some of the most interesting uh, dystopias the you know the recent dystopias that I've read uh, are still the ones that follow uh, that um, you know, uh, themes, um, but I'm open, <laughs> you know, if you, if, uh, you know, you have, a, a different, a different definition, I'll be, I'll be um, curious. Felipe, would you like to say something here on the chat? <laughs> um, 
Philippe is very much into contemporary dystopias and um, he's about to defend his, you know, this is very <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you very, very much once again. Um, as we were waiting to, to be here talking, uh, we were chatting in the backstage and uh, I, I was, uh, reminding Rafaela that it's been about a year that she was here with us in a similar online conference. Uh, well, it was not a conference then, it was an interview. And uh, for those who are curious to know more about Rafaela's ideas and Tom Moylan's ideas, they were together then. This conversation was translated and is going to be published very soon in an issue um, of uh, Alere, the, the periodical, okay? And we hope it won't be that long, Rafaela, to have you back again with us. So I, I would love to. <laughs> hope to see you soon again to, you know, have those wonderful conversations about utopias, dystopias, and hope, which is something that is so central always but now maybe more than ever so thank you very much for your wonderful talk thank you again elton for being there in the backstage and uh, thank you all who have joined us this afternoon evening in italy i know fabio is following us he's in italy too <laughs> um, thank you very much really it was it was really a pleasure for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on with the conference program. So I hope you will follow the other activities for this afternoon. We are going to have the workshops and uh, later on the artistic uh, performance. So join us then. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.